the Higgs system of preference, which I've used, is the linear, is the sigma model. You can use that to give masses to the vector bosons, but not to the photon, because there's not enough degrees of freedom. And so that sigma model as a Higgs system has the following consequences. <laughs> Okay. There's the following consequence. First, there are three massive effective bonds and one massless. That's correct. That's what we see in nature. Point number two. There is a relation between the vector bonds and masses, which is called which is the row parameter. It's one plus a with the corrections. This agrees also with what is observed. Point number three. The parity is violated. This is not specific to the sigma model. But it is, it is specific if you generate the fermion masses used by the Higgs field. And the fermions are in doublets in such a way that you have to gen generate the mass by the Higgs system. Well, that's there too. And then finally, when you use this, this standard model, parity will, not be, will be conserved in electromagnetic interaction, will not be violated. So all of this agrees very well with experiment. As soon as you start changing something on the Higgs sector, things get different and you have less agreement. What you can do then is usually change the parameter or something and fit it such that things are okay. So let's look at that. Yeah. One of the things is that there is, there is a problem, another problem I have not discussed with you, it has nothing to do with the Higgs sector, is the problem of strong CP violation. It is a fact that when you look to the strong interactions of quarks among themselves, there seems to be something called, seems to generate a very strong violation of CP invariance, which is not observed experimentally. How to eliminate that? Well, there is one cure has been given by Petsche and Quinn. And the cure that they give is that there should be two A systems, two sigma ones, so eight systems. That has one problem, the vacuum alignment problem. It means you have two Higgs systems, and one of the Higgs systems can be like this, and the other like that. It, it picks the direction in either spin space. One of the components gets a vacuum excitation value. And these must be the same, or else the photo gets a mass. Okay, so if you have two Higgs systems, you have to do something to avoid the photo getting a mass which is what happens if the vacuum are not aligned. So that means you lose a prediction. So the Petsche quint solution loses the prediction that the photon has zero mass. So that's a negative point to that model. Of course, we, there's a positive point to the model, namely it solves the strong CP problem. But that has still another problem because then there is something called an axiom which they have never seen. So this is one of the unsolved problems of quantum chromodynamics, a strong CP problem, and no one knows what the solution is. It is a very peculiar problem because it depends specifically on boundary conditions. And it is strange that something that happens here depends on boundary conditions. And I don't know what it means, I don't know what it goes, I will forget about it. But there is that problem, and someday somebody has to solve it. It's an unsolved problem. <coughs> In any case, the solution of Petsche and Quinn does not work also because of this vacuum alignment problem. It does not, uh, well, it is not good. Then there's another thing. If you have more than the sigma model, that will be means that you get more Higgs particles. You have seen nothing. If you have two sigma bar particles, you will have five more particles, physical particles, that you should observe, <coughs> which we have seen nothing. So that's only disagreeable. Yeah. And one of them is this axiom. The fact that if you have a complicated Higgs system, there is bound to be one Higgs, not necessarily, but plausible, there is one Higgs which has a very likely very small mass. This was explored first by Passerino and myself, not, not yes. But I will not go into that. And later on, this was rediscovered by, uh, what's his name, this little jerk? <laughs> uh, the 
guy who did us with the field was Ross Wiltshire. <laughs> <laughs> And so that we found the axiom which is that thing. If you have supersymmetry, which has been very popular for some time, supersymmetry, to my knowledge, assumes that for every boson there is a fermion. Why? I really don't know. I have not seen any advantage of it. And it predicts many more particles, none of which have been seen. On top of it here, in a supersymmetric theory, you will have a complicated Higgs system. And you have to ask why the photon has zero mass. Because only in the simplest Higgs system is there not enough degrees of freedom going around to give the photon a mass. In all other cases, like in supersymmetry, there are so many Higgs you wonder why the photon doesn't get a mass. I know of only one thing that is in favor if you take the simplest supersymmetric model and if you study supersymmetry, you can look at it. Then it turns out that in that simplest model, by accident or whatever, the photon has zero mass to it. So in the minimal supersymmetric model, the two factors are aligned and the photon is massless. So that at least is a good thing of the minimal supersymmetric model. But I have the feeling it's already out. Is it not so? I hope not. Huh? I hope not. You hope not. Oh, how is not good Does your life depend on that in any way? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, we must, that's the important thing, we must start searching for the Higgs. We must try to find it. And now the first thing to search for is, is this equation there. It's the correction to the low parameter due to the Higgs. <coughs> there is first a correction due to the top mass, and I discussed that with you. And in fact, the top has now been found, and we know what the top mass is, and that agrees very well. Except there is a small residue, could be, and there is also a relative correction due to the Higgs particle. So if you measure very carefully the masses of W plus and the mass of Z0, make the ratio fitted to this equation, know that you have the mass of the top, you have all parameters with one exception, which is the Higgs mass. So by a careful measurement of the effect of both the masses, you can get the statement of the Higgs mass. But it comes with a logarithm, as you see. For this reason, it's not very sensitive. You get the Higgs mass, but with large error bars. The Higgs mass you get out of this is 90 G TV or something. It's low, because if the Higgs had such low a mass, they would have produced it already at lip directly. They have not seen it. So this equation here predicts the Higgs mass, which uh, is too small, but then, as I say, the error bars are large because of the logarithm. So the first statement is the Higgs that you would simply get by looking to the row parameter, that's not there. there is Either they are subject funny, or I don't know what we will find out. Someday we will find out. So it's stated here on the last line if the Higgs is 160 GeV, then the logarithmic term, the second term, gives the same result as subtracting 7.3 GeV from the top mass. So that second correction if the Higgs is 160 GeV, can be compensated by changing the top mass by 7.3 GeV. Yeah. However, the error bar on the top mass are something like 5 GeV, so it could be. Yeah. We don't know. Mm -hmm. In fact, I believe the error bars on the top, as you can see, is 4.3 GeV. And so, uh, if the Higgs is less than one and a half times the mass of the vector boson, which is about 120 GeV, that would still deal with the whole affair within error bars. But it starts becoming a little bit uncomfortable. But no one knows the answer, and we must wait at the LHC to actually see the Higgs. Now, will, will the, uh, the question is now, what will they see at the LHC? So the first way of looking for the Higgs is to this low parameter, <coughs> making a careful measurement, 
and so far that doesn't help us, we don't see it. But the errors are still too big, you cannot say it. Now, there is another thing, yeah, and that's a curious effect, so I wish you to understand what's going on, what nature has been doing. Without the Higgs particle, the theory is normally normalizable. What does that mean? It means that there are infinities which you cannot absorb in the free parameters of the theory. That is to say, there will be the infinities that are observed experimentally, can be observed experimentally. So what we must do, if you may take the Higgs away, there are infinities which are physically observable. That's the precise statement. Now, so what we can do is try to, f if, we, if we have the Higgs, going to the Higgs going to infinity, the mass going to infinity, we think that's the same way as having no Higgs. And wherever there is an infinity, if there were no Higgs, should be something that grows proportional with the Higgs mass. So we are looking in the theory, if there are effects, it become big, if the Higgs becomes very heavy. And we know from this general reasoning that there should be. So then we go sit down and we wonder where. where. Well, the, the best places to look at is the mass of the vector bosons, because these have a chance <coughs> of some terms proportional to the Higgs mass squared. The reason is, you look to other things, they are dimensionless and so on. You must have something which has the dimension of a mass squared to be sensitive to something like the Higgs mass squared. So that equation that you are seeing there, here, that's the first thing you notice, go look for effects that grow as the Higgs becomes bigger, you have to look to the vector bosons. And you can actually, it's true, and you can find that the mass of the charge vector boson by a self-energy diagram involving the Higgs gets such a contribution. So the mass of the charge vector boson, if the Higgs becomes heavy, that mass becomes very big, and here's the equation. And the same holds for the mass of the neutral vector boson. The trouble is, of course, these masses of these particles, we don't know what they are before the radiative corrections, so we cannot see that there. What we are looking at is the mass of the particle plus the correction. And we don't know what's the correction and what's the mass. So still have nothing. But you could see something if you look to the ratio of the two. The ratio of the two, we know it is fixed by the row parameter. Yeah, you've seen that. So this one, if you know this one, we know that one. And now we can maybe see the ratio of these two. So when you see this, you say, he people are, I found a way of putting a limit on the x. Let me compute the ratio of these two. And then you have a terrible dissolution, because it turns out that the ratio of these two is the same as the ratio of these two. So you can, it's still invisible. The correction to the one is as big as the correction to the other. OK, and that's very sad, but that's the fact of life. When I saw this for the first time, I started crying. Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, my wife said, why are you crying? I said, because there's a screening serum. So we call this a screening serum. It's not a serum. There's no screening, but it just means you can see nothing. <laughs> yeah. So this is the of not being able to see something. This is still very bad. Yeah. So you compute the coefficients A and B, and you discover they have the same ratio as the masses, and there's nothing you can say. So you have to do it with the next term, and the next term is the logarithm <coughs> of the x, and that I've shown you in the row that That's correction that goes with the logarithm of the x mass. This is just bad luck. If it hadn't been like that, we would have been able to state the x must be so much, but we cannot. So that's, uh, that's pretty terrible. <coughs> so unfortunately, explicit calculation shows that these coefficients have the same ratio as these masses. 
the Nakuru probably got something, but they are diminished because of the higher order of the particles. Uh, or we have, we people have computed this, and there's little hope you can get at it. So that's the statement here that you don't need to hear. So, now there is something which is, uh, which is subtle. And I don't know if I can sell it to you, but let me try. You have this equation. Because we now go to another chapter, this equation. I'm going to concentrate on this. This has been, this equation has been computed by computing one loop diagrams. So it's still doing perturbation theory. So it is the lowest order perturbation theory. What happens if the Higgs class becomes bigger? In actual fact, if the Higgs class becomes big, higher orders become also important. It becomes a strongly interacting theory. So you get this term, and you get an additional term, this is a company constant extra, and then this is the mass of the Higgs by the factor of the mass squared. And the next term will be m to the force divided by big m to the force. And if the Higgs mass is big, if this quantity is bigger than 1, then the terms that we have neglected here may become as important as the lowest other term. We get a strong interaction. And that means basically that if the Higgs is sufficiently big, like 3 or 400 GeV, it's rather big, uh, then this calculation cannot be trusted anymore because there are additional effects that may contribute. So we see nothing here. What does it mean? It does mean there is nothing. If the Higgs is heavy, we cannot even trust what's here. So even that mild disagreement that we have at this time could be a consequence of that. We just don't know. How can we ever find out? We can find that out in this way. Look to another process which also has a correction like this. And see if both corrections reproduce correctly what you can compute in light lowest order, or because it's a different process, if it's different. So you have two processes. If perturbation theory works and you need to take only the lowest order, then I can compute both corrections, and I will, of course, be able to compute also the ratio of the corrections. However, if the Higgs is strongly interacting, then I don't know what this correction is, and I know even less what that correction is. And when I compute the ratio, then I see that it doesn't need to follow my calculations. So what you have to do is look to another process. It's very unlikely people will do that, but I have to mention this. You look to a process like this, where you have a left, <coughs> use a pair of W plus W minus, <coughs> it will have a correction due to the Higgs. And you start seeing if that correction here sort of agrees with what happens to the row parameter. And that will give you information whether that Higgs limit is correct or whether we are dealing with a strongly interacting Higgs. I hope I make myself clear, but if not, I read it carefully over and you will see. Now, if the Higgs mass is bigger than 500 GeV, then higher orders must be taken into account. The question is, can we say anything whatsoever if Higgs is so heavy? If the Higgs is so heavy that the sigma model, there is, a, there is an interaction in there which becomes stronger as the mass, with the ratio of the mass of the Higgs to the vector motion mass. So it becomes a strongly interacting theory. So if the Higgs is heavy, then we will not be able to recognize the sigma model because there are strong interactions and all kinds of things happen that we cannot compute. The question is, can we still do something? Well, the only thing you can do is compare with another case where you think that the sigma model works and where you have a strong interaction, and then you pray and you hope you get the same. That is the the tactics that have been used in this context, and that is uh, what we are going to look at next. So we are going to look to the Higgs at very high energies, 
and let's first get an understanding of what goes on. So let's consider the scattering of a vector boson and a Z0, and become again the W boson and a Z0. This is a process that can have more. Can you see that in practice? Well, it's a bit more complicated, but basically you can observe this kind of things in processes where you produce a pair. So I want to study this. Now the theory of this is at this level, those are the better basis series, easy. This is a diagram, this is another diagram, and this is a diagram, and I'm going to concentrate on the behavior of these diagrams as function of the energy of the two incoming particles. And this diagram, without telling you, without giving you the details, behaves like the first power of the force power of the energy. So the contribution, this, when you go to high energy, it goes up. This is the force power of the energy. This second diagram also goes up with the force power of the energy. And then this, the force diagram, <coughs> That is very typical for a gate theory, also grows with the force power of the energy, except with the opposite sign. So, these three diagrams together behave all like energy squared. So, without talking about the Higgs, the scattering cross section for these things increases with the energy squared, or the amplitude, I should say becomes very big if you go to high energy. What is the Higgs doing? The Higgs is doing what it is supposed to do, namely make the theory good behaved at high energies. So you introduce the Higgs, and this is a possibility. <coughs> you exchange the Higgs, and it turns out this behaves also with energy square. This is precisely the opposite sign of what the first three have. And then you look to all four processes together, the amplitude becomes a constant. And the amplitude becoming a constant, that is what you must have in a good theory. It should not blow up as you go to high energies. So what you see is the function of the Higgs system is to compensate. You first have very bad behavior that cancels, and then the Higgs system cancels the last piece. And then you get something which is okay. What happens? If you take away the Higgs, if you take away the Higgs, then the amplitude for WZ0 scattering will grow like E squared. And something blows up. So, I should say that the behavior of growing with the energy is not for all Ws and Z, it's only for those where the polarization is along the direction of motion, so longitudinal polarized. So if the Higgs mass, if the Higgs, that first diagram, were not there, then these here grow with the energy square, and at some point they, they, this, this thing becomes too big. It means the breakdown of perturbation theory. These diagrams should not become too big because then it's, it starts to go wrong on various points. It's usually one expresses that in something called the unitarity limit. But basically what happens is that if these are too big, then the second order, which tries the same thing, becomes also big. And so <coughs> higher orders become as big as the lower order. Such amplitude should never become of the order of above or higher. Because then you know that the second order doing it twice adds on to it, you cannot ignore it. But it is the Higgs which is the savior. Now you can see how it works when you have a heavy Higgs. If you have a light Higgs, if the Higgs is heavy, then this diagram, this possibility, will play a role only if the energy involved is larger than this Higgs mass. So this Higgs starts having an influence only when the energy that you have is of the order of this Higgs mass. The cancellation of this diagram is something that starts only at an energy roughly of the order of magnitude of the Higgs. And that's the way it works in practice. <coughs> 
Now, now we have to, uh, to look at this. It's not a good thing. It would be nice if we had something else. But we have nothing else. The question is, when the Higgs is heavy, what do these vector bosons do? How, what happens when we cannot look anymore to the lowest order? How should we treat the theory? We don't know. The only thing we can do is look to an example. They you have sort of the same thing. And the example that you look at is the sigma model applied to low energy pion pion scattering. Low energy, if you have pions, they scatter over each other, they have a strong interaction, and all kinds of things happen. And one of the things that happens is that pions, if they scatter, they may give rise to a resonance. So they interact so strongly that they make a bound state of spin one. That's possible. It's called the Rome zone, what one observes. So if the pions have a strong interaction, their collision may give rise to another part, to a bound state, the Rome zone. No. That's nice. If a similar thing, if at high energy with the vector bosons, we have a similar thing, that means that if we scatter the vector bosons at some energy, we will get a new resonance bound state of two vector bosons. So the great issue is whether two vector bosons can have a resonance. And the next question is, if this happens roughly in the same way as it happens for the pions, would we see it at the LHC? Well, here is the comparison. When you look to the model for pions, there is a parameter in there. And in fact, this is uh, here, this equation here, this is the scattering of pions, where you include three diagrams and the one loop diagram. You get this as a result, with parameters beta 1, beta 2. And the V is a number which is the vacuum expectation value of the sigma. The sigma sits in the vacuum and the amount of it is specified what V is. And for the pions, we have a good fit with data. V is about 250 G V, and if you look to vector boards, we have 250 G V. So if you want to go to low energy pion physics, you can go to very high energy vector boson scattering physics, but you must scale from 98 MeV to 250 GeV. So that's an enormous scale factor. <coughs> but that's what you have to do. What does it mean? It means that if at the low energy you make a Romazon, which we know has a mass of 750 GeV, you can deduce from that a similar resonance for the vector bosons would be, in fact, about 3D. Yeah, with that scale factor. So here we have a wonderful statement. If the, fact, if the Higgs is not there, if the vector bosons, therefore, are correctly described by the sigma model, and I mentioned you all the things that go in there, if the Higgs is not there, if the vector boson, the Higgs sector, is described by the sigma model with very high Higgs, The pion physics is also described by the same sigma model. Uh, then comparison of the low energy pion physics, where we can see a resonance, indicates that there would be a resonance between the W's, and the resonance would be at about 2 TV. So that's a real heavy monster. Is that impossible? Well, the LHC actually goes much higher than 2 TV. It goes to, what is it, 14 TV or so. Uh, so, 2 TV, they could make it. So here comes the question. Will they at the LHC see this monster? And now, there's a piece of bad news that I have to give you. Uh, and for this, we have to go to the theoretical understanding that was given to us by Mr. Lehmann to biophysics. Mr. Lehman tried to understand who pion pion interactions could give rise to a Romeism as observed experimentally. So let's see what's involved in that. Let's see the analysis of Mr. Lehman. And the Lehman analysis makes use of something called partial wave expansion. 
and the partial wave expansion is that the amplitude of the scattering of the piles of piles is given by such an expansion. We must try to establish what these coefficients are. T. These these PL are the Lagrange reporting arms of quantum mechanics, representing states of Erlangen to one, two, etc. And you use that because the thing you're looking at is a Romanov. And the Roman zone is a state of spin one, that is to say, angular momentum one. So you would say that P one will be the dominating angle. So that's why you choose this one. Now I will not give you all the details. You can look through these things yourself or other literature that I told you about. I'll just tell you what happens. <coughs> so you do this calculation there to, de to determine what T one is, this thing here. You determine that from the same amount, lowest order calculation. You will find that T1 is a good part to pass to S and a part to pass to S squared. That's what you get from the calculation that you could also do in the sum up model. And this, this same cotine cotine just delta that you have here is, e, is given by these coefficients A and B. As I say, I don't want to go into any details. The important part is that if you do the calculation of this thing, <coughs> here you have the, the thing that you get in lowest order. It involves three, two unknowns, beta one and beta two. These ones you do not know. These are uh, whatever. Yeah. You have to fit them to the data. It turns out that if you do the calculation, the only thing that depends on is the difference of beta 1 to beta minus beta 2. If you restrict yourself to the <coughs> ice bit 1 cell, where you see the, the rho missile, and you call that beta, and then you find, going through this calculation, that beta equals 1 third. Yeah. So what does that mean? It means the following. You find beta, and then you can say what this thing is going to be. You can compute that, and you can see this t here can be written down as a function of beta. So to repeat, so that you know what I'm doing, I have this equation. Yeah. If you do a one loop calculation, you can get everything is determined. You can compute it. Yeah. So you know beta one, beta two. In particular, you know beta one minus beta two. So you can compute it. And then you find that this determines the amount of Romanism scattering. And then this is the important curve. You can write down what you get for this amplitude T1 for the various cases <coughs> as a function of the energy. In the case of A, B, C, D, depending on what beta is. And this coefficient beta, which you get by a calculation, but which may be more complicated, is it's not perturbed if you never know for sure what you have. You can see that it's determined by how these things behave at low energy. This is just the most threshold. And you see as beta goes bigger, this one goes up. The interesting thing is what happens here. And this you've got, since the equation you have, you can extrapolate to high energies, you can actually do that. Here you get the curve, so what we do previous curve was here. Yeah. Now here is what happens when you go to high energies. Now for low beta, you see nothing much is happening, but as soon as beta is sufficiently large, there's the maximum of five here, you get a resonance at two TV, that would be the low. Yeah. So the big question is, what is beta? Mm. If beta happens to be five, we can look forward to a resonance at 2 TeV, which for sure we would see experimentally at the LHC. So, what did, Bate, what did Lehmann find? He found that beta, from the case of pyrophysics, is actually one third. That's far away from five. For one third, we have no resonance. <coughs> Beta one third is between zero and two. 
between P0 and 2 between uh, the curves B and C. There you see nothing. Beta one third is really bad. The beta is one third, <coughs> and we have no lessons. There is no, no way that you get anything like this. So it's a piece, it's a peak. And so this is what Lehman found for the case of pyro scattering. And yet, we know that there is the row method, so there is a resonance experimentally. So Lehman thought maybe there is another way of producing interaction between the pyros. And he wrote down this diagram, in which you have pyro scattering through a nucleon, be a proton or a neutron, because pyros couple the protons and neutrons, and so there is an existing possibility. And he computed that, and then that gave a contribution to beta, which could, could be such that you got the resonance. So here you have the message of Mr. Lehman. If I just take the, the sigma model and apply that to pyrophysics, I get no Romanism. I see that experimentally. I can understand that under the assumption that there exist nucleons and they also contribute to pyro pyro scattering. So you have to go beyond the sigma model. You have to introduce nucleons. What would be logical then, if we want this thing to happen also in the case of the standard model, you have to use, introduce some sort of nucleons in order to get this behavior. We have no nucleons. What, what, what's that? What, what, what are nucleons? There are no neutron and proton at 2 or 3 TeV. These masses like that, they are not there. But uh, your, our quarks, you must have very heavy quarks. And actually, series of that kind where you would assume that there are such heavy quarks were made by people making series called Technicolor. So if you hear about, that would be one way. If you have Technicolor, you could make the analysis, you could make it go and also perhaps get the lessons. It's, Technicolor is in deep trouble for other reasons because these very heavy pseudo-nucleons would have their influence elsewhere too, also in the road parameter. So we don't think that happens. And then, we come to a sad conclusion that CERN, if there is no Higgs, it's exceedingly unlikely they will see a resonance between the vector volumes. And what will they see? Well, it's everybody's guess, some rising goes to flat out, and you have no idea what's going on. Experiment must tell us what is actually going on. So this is the last curve that I show you, and so far we know nothing. As soon as we know what happens below one TeV, we can make a guess. But so far, the theory, whatever it gives, is not very promising. What will happen there? I have no idea. We have to wait for the LAC to do that. So luckily enough, I have succeeded in finishing my lectures 15 minutes before my time. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>
something else is not there, you are in trouble because these first three together give something that will eventually violate probability such or other. It's not possible. It must be dumped off. Something must make it go flat. So in any case, if they start with the LHC to go into the domain where this gets big, we will get information on that last piece, and if it is not the Higgs, it's something else, and then we really want to know. What did you think of the bond conviviality, from the lattice, on the Well, I have had long discussions with uh, some guy from Daisy who is now at CERN. Uh, Asenfeld? Uh, Lucia. 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 And I was at Daisy for a little while. He came to me and said, from the lattice we get the limit. The Higgs cannot be heavier than C of the GV or 4 of the GV. <coughs> and I couldn't believe that. So I said, that he was talking also and he got very mad at me. And so I saw for a while and spoke with other people and I said to him, did you try other lattices than just the square one? It turns out that if you start using other lattices, you can make this what you want. What do you mean by other lattices? Not the square. I have a whole circle of what you can do. So the choice of a lattice of rectangular things all the rest, consequences, that may not be true. We have to be very careful with this business. That's what I felt, because if this is not determined in the theory here, that ought to reproduce itself somewhere in some other sense, also in that theory. But it's only non perturbative, uh, hmm? it's the only non perturbative tradition for the bottom of the case that we have. Yeah, but remember, you have a freedom. And never forget that the freedom is the type of letters you take. You know, you know what it is, a lattice. You're sure that uh, you divide up space in, uh, in this way, but the division can happen referring to, square, to squares or little trapeziums or what have you. And that makes a, a difference in the answer. Because it shouldn't be. So the real physics results are those who do not depend on the particular lattice you take. Uh, yeah. I think this yeah, I would like to know if other kind of calculations using lattices depend on the, the type you choose. <coughs> yes. So it's on a positive well, thing. You will in general have it. You have to investigate it. If you do a calculation with a lattice, you must be you must investigate to what extent it depends on the type of lattice. The easiest way you can do is make like the, the, the lattice not square but rectangular, you know, like this. But this you must do, else you do not swap. The letter is not a real thing. It's a way of cut off. And if you cut off in different ways, you may get some, some other results. We have to check that. But you, you, are not, you are not telling us that Lucia didn't pay attention to the cut-off dependence. I cannot believe that. No, he did pay attention, but he didn't pay attention to the type of letters that he had. I cannot believe that, but okay. I think the check of different lattices uh, is wrong, so I have not really been explored. I mean, there is a change that we can change, the, the lattice action. And the result should be independent but of the lattice uh, action you use. But let's, let's be honest, let's, 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 let's understand that you know that these people at one time came with an upper limit for the Higgs mass. Otherwise, three hundred CV. You also notice that that has gone away. And I claim that that was an artifice from the shape of the lattice. 
God, I couldn't believe it, that they could get from, from the letters an upper limit on the Higgs mass. You see what happens? You, you look to the Higgs and you make it heavier. And then you look in the, in the channel of W scattering, yeah, or whatever, something. No. You look to the, to the mechanism, to the Higgs itself. And when you make the Higgs heavy, you get a bomb state which starts to look like the Higgs. And what happens is the mass of the Higgs goes up, but then the non, the, the, the non perturbative effect makes the mass go back. That's what happens. It's very curious. It would be nice if it was like that. But I felt that that didn't make any sense, you know. And so that turned out that this turning around, making the Higgs mass heavier, the lessons you would see would, uh, by another choice of things, actually go up and do any longer. As far as you remember, the computations perturbed in one going beyond one loop or two loops, is also doing something like that. I mean, they start decreasing the mass of the Higgs. Yeah. As far as I know. I haven't seen any new paper on that, but in well, the past, you know, it's not it like that. You get stuff if you have to. You have to do two loops, and by the time you do that, you start to worry if three loops is important, and you, you, you give up. Yeah, another question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one question and, and one comment. The question is in this Lehman analysis that you did with Phi Phi scattering, did you also look at the isospin zero and isospin two channels to see what they get? And other, other isospin channels. Other isospin channels. I did not. I mean, the, the Lehman analysis. I discussed with him for half a year. You, know. you should have said that if you're, you're not there, huh? to the audience, you should have said that the, your collaborator in that world is your daughter, Elena Bellman. Well, it was a complicated issue. Mr. Lehman, who is now unfortunately dead, is a very smart fellow, but he has something he is sort of paranoid about doing something wrong. <laughs> that was incredible. So I did spend half a year at Daisy. And every morning he came to my office and he started talking about the signal model. And slowly I got the impression that there was something wrong. And uh, it took me a long time to find out because he was always so evasive when he got in the neighborhood of that. And what was wrong was this. He was always thinking in terms of uh, dispersion relations. And you can have one or two subtractions, etc. And in his calculation, he had at some point assumed less subtractions than you could have. And he didn't want to admit it. And so it became every day we started our going into the room. And then let's say, let's have a coffee. We came back. <laughs> It was the most curious thing that, uh, that I've seen. Finally, by formulating it correctly, I, we sort of agreed and we came to the, to the, what happened is then I left Daisy and my daughter, who was also in higher physics at that time at least, went to Daisy and started working on the same problem and talked with Mr. Lehman. And finally, the, the whole thing was written down in a paper that I wrote the verse of that paper was unbelievably painful and slow. And my daughter somehow succeeded in getting that done correctly. And so in, the, in that paper, I did that. Also, Lehman was extremely afraid of making errors. This model of man was absolutely neurotic about the possibility of making a error. And that's why in his whole life he published only two or three or four papers. He was very smart, but this thing. He was very good physicist. Talk to him, you know. The other comment is that when you show, at least for the row, you show that for different beta, you have very narrow or very wide objects. So if you look at the, I guess that if you look at the zero channel for the width of the Higgs, the Higgs as it becomes heavier, it also becomes wider, right? Possibly. So you mean, in other words, the sigma. Yeah, the sigma so seen as well. I don't know anything about that. The comment was, I don't know how to implement that on the lattice, because usually people looking at resonances in pi and pi and scattering on the lattice, they get zero width resonances. Uh, and it's, uh, there, are, there are recent papers where they have already calculated the row width, but that's a problem. 
So it's complicated to get real information on low energy pine pine in this country and, and right. wide resonances. Yes. Uh, well, thank you. I know nothing about it. You see, looking at the Sigma channel is like looking at the haze itself. Yeah. So this shows this curve turning around. I was talking. No, but even, even in the road channel, in the road channel, there is a recent CP Pax collaboration that has made an analysis of hadron uh, bound states. And what they find for the row is they have a very nice description of the mass, but it's, it's zero width. So uh, even for the row, the width is sizable. So it's, one has to be careful about interpreting the results of the lattice because then you're getting zero width hadrons, and that's very different from what you're seeing in the experiment. Well, that's just because it's below threshold. Yeah, that's be because uh, of the. the quarks are too heavy. That's, for the, that's the problem of, of yeah, minimum. Go, go to low or of the minimum. Uh, uh,